At the meeting, one of the European industry's own scientists presented an even more disturbing report. Dr. Lefebvre theorizes that vinyl chloride is absorbed in body fats and carried to the brain. Despite the startling prospect that vinyl chloride could affect the brain, the companies took no action and told no one. The present political climate in the U.S. is such that a campaign by Mr. R. Nader and others could force an industrial upheaval via new laws or strict interpretation of pollution and occupational health laws. A year later, another Italian researcher, Dr. Cesare Maltoni, found evidence of a rare liver cancer, angiosarcoma. In studies sponsored by the European industry, cancer appeared in rats exposed to levels of vinyl chloride common on factory floors in the U.S. The panicked industry came running. About two or three American representatives of the chemical industry go over to Bologna, and the Europeans tell them that there are cancers now not only at the very high levels, at thousands of parts per million, but down to 250 parts per million. And yet they are determined to keep this secret. And they go so far as to even sign a secrecy agreement between the Europeans and the Americans so that each of their researchers will be secret from everybody outside the industry. They get together, the American representatives and the European representatives, and they say, this is top secret, we're not going to let it get public? Exactly. To anybody? They, to workers? To the workers? To the doctors? And the to the doctors, no one is going to get this information except the companies who have signed the secrecy agreement. Conoco, B.F. Goodrich, Dow, Shell, Ethel, Union Carbide, some of the founding fathers of the chemical revolution were among those who signed the secrecy agreement even as they were admitting to themselves the bad news. February 13th, 1973, Union Carbide, internal correspondence, confidential. Dow Chemical Company reviewed the work on the European study. They report the results on rats are probably undeniable. Ethyl Corporation, enter office, subject, vinyl chloride. All agreed the results certainly indicate a positive carcinogenic effect above or at 250 parts per million. The companies knew, working with vinyl chloride, even at low levels of exposure, could cause cancer. By 1973, the federal government was trying to catch up with the chemical revolution. A new agency, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH, published an official request seeking all health and safety information regarding vinyl chloride. Two months later, a staff member of the Industries Trade Association sent a letter to member companies urging that they tell NIOSH about Dr. Maltoni's findings. March 26th, 1973. There is the aspect of moral obligation not to withhold from the government significant information having occupational and environmental relevance. May 21st, 1973. Manufacturing Chemists Association, minutes of meeting. But meeting in their conference room in Washington, they discussed keeping secret what they knew of the dangers posed by vinyl chloride. We should not volunteer reference to the European project, but in response to direct inquiry, we could not deny awareness of the project and knowledge concerning certain preliminary results. It's an extraordinary situation where they know they should be telling the government uh, about this problem. They know that uh, they're wrong not, not to tell them. And then they admit that their engaging in this kind of activity can be legitimately seen as evidence of an illegal conspiracy. May 31st, 1973, Union Carbide, internal correspondence, confidential. 
A union carbide executive reported to corporate headquarters that if the March letter admitting knowledge of Maltoni's work ever became public, it could, could be, be construed, construed as, as evidence. evidence of an illegal conspiracy by industry if the information were not made public or at least made available to the government. You kind of avoid as a historian the idea that there are conspiracies or that there are people planning the world in a certain way. Uh, you just try to avoid that because it's, uh, it seems too, too unreal and too um, frightening in its implications. Uh, yet when you look at these documents, you say, yes, there are people who understood what was going on, people who thought about the, uh, about the crisis that was uh, engulfing them or about to engulf them and tried in every which way to uh, get out of that crisis and actually to, in some sense, suppress an issue. Do you think all of this added up to, to use your word, a conspiracy? In a moral sense, I think it was a conspiracy. We have learned from the secret archive that when the industry met with NIOSH, it did not mention Maltoni or angiosarcoma. Union Carbide, internal correspondence, confidential. The presentation was extremely well received, and the chances of precipitous action by NIOSH on vinyl chloride were materially lessened. NIOSH did not appear to want to alienate a cooperative industry. Historians don't like to use you know, broad political terms like cover-up. But there's really no other term that you can use for this because the industry uh, had the information, they uh, knew the significance of the information they had, and they refused to tell the government because they were afraid the government would take action that would protect the workforce. And yet during this time, Dan Ross and others like him, working in vinyl chloride plants, were being told that there was nothing to worry about, that there's no danger. That's correct. The industry kept assuring the workforce that there was not anything that they need to be concerned about and that they were uh, going to protect the workforce. But they didn't. No, they certainly did not.